So, what makes a movie so bad that it's good? Well, I think I should start by saying the mythical movie that is both terrible and highly enjoyable is really a very rare beast. There are hundreds of movies that are so bad they're good, but I'd argue that these are mostly just terrible movies. Don't worry about the lava lamp, by the way. He's on his Christmas break too. He'll be back soon. The so bad it's good phrase really means that a movie is so bad it's fun to watch. It's a roller coaster ride of laughing at bad acting and puzzling over directorial decisions. When people say something is so bad it's good, whether it's a movie or not, I think what they really mean is, it's so bad, it's enjoyable. Perhaps the most famous of these so bad they're good movies is The Room. What's new with you? Well, I'm just sitting up here thinking, you know. I got a question for you. Yeah. You think girls like to cheat like guys do? What makes you say that? But good, bad pretenders make up a whole subgenre of B-movies. They're usually B-movies, although occasionally you do find studio films falling under that heading. But, regardless of the budget, here's the nub of my thinking. Movies that are so bad they're good, usually aren't good at all. Really, there's usually one or two good scenes which find their way onto YouTube, scenes which are positively hilarious, but usually, the rest of the film is just dirge. Take, for example, the much-mocked 2006 remake of The Wicker Man, made famous for this scene. Not the beast! Ah! Out of my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! <laughs> that scene is hilariously bad, and the rest of the film is bad too, but not hilariously. Really, The Wicker Man is different from most bad films because it has a moment like that. Most really bad films could only dream of having 30 highly entertaining seconds. Here are two clips from Manos, Hands of Fate. Stop! What foolishness is this? Must be the master himself. Oh, Mike, I'm scared. He has the meanest look. That dog. I'd hate to run up on him in the dark or even in the light for that matter. <sighs> Good God, it's like it slows down time. Manos is often cited as being the worst film ever made, and it really could be. But then The Room is often cited as being the worst film ever made, and that really could be. So, what's the difference between Manos and The Room? Two films that are done technically badly, although admittedly, Manos is probably one of the most incompetently edited things ever created. Both films have cliched and two-dimensional characters, and both have unoriginal and rather silly scripts. But The Room is fun to watch. It's the sort of thing you can grit your teeth at and shout at. Manos is... unwatchable. Manos is difficult to get through, and many B-movies of its ilk are. Even something with a reputation for being so bad it's good, something that isn't usually attributed to Manos because 85% of people who start it die at some point during the screening. Even something with that reputation, that'd be good to laugh at with friends before or after a night of doing something else, like the Rollerblade 7, isn't usually that at all. The Rollerblade 7 has some god-awful action sequences in it, but really the rest of the movie is just terribly boring. Manos, I couldn't pick out 10 seconds that are funny. So, are bad movies that are so badly done, they're funny, what we're really talking about? Well, maybe. Probably. But what makes them funny? Manos, Sinjinor, Mazes and Monsters, these aren't funny films. There's a couple of bits here and there in these films, but really, those bits are separated by tedious, by-the-numbers, cheap filmmaking. But something like I, Frankenstein, my own personal worst film, is cringy and funny throughout. By funny, I mean you can laugh at it throughout for being so very, very awful. There are, however, no standout laughs, and I wouldn't really call it so bad it's good, because it is painful. My queen! We found the creature. Mm. 
really, all of this stuff is just mulch. The people who watch bad movies for enjoyment, I think usually it's a social thing, and I think usually they're really looking for something more than just bad. Ghost Rider, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, Jack and Jill. It's like driving a truck from New York to Brasilia. Yeah, you'll see a lot of scenery, but God does that scenery get tedious. Those films I mentioned are the notable ones. Most are so unexceptional, they start to blur into one. The bad movies that are noticed usually are because of a particular facet that's along the lines of what were they thinking? Halle Berry in the Catwoman role, the terrible sex scene in Showgirls, the awful creatures in the Garbage Pail Kids. Don't mind if I do! What's my name? Dunkachino! It's a whole new game! Dunkachino! You want creamy goodness? I'm your friend. Say hello to my chocolate blend. Oh. It's not so much that these parts are remembered for being bad, but for being weird. I'd argue when most people talk about a movie being so bad it's good, they're not just saying it's bad, but inexplicable. Disaster movie isn't very good, but that's because it's lazy. Movie 43 isn't very good for the same reason, and it's only notable because it got a lot of well-known actors in it. Really, like most bad films, these are completely forgettable. The real bad movies that are watchable are those that are constantly engaging their audience with their unbelievable nature. The movies that are so peculiar and so out there and have such strange decisions in them, they almost become a study. Any film can be boring. Any film can have bad acting. And any film can have an odd scene in a platitude of dullness. It's the weirdness and the seeming lack of self-awareness of The Room, Plan 9 from Outer Space, and Double Down that make these films kind of special. And like I say, there are many films out there that have aspects or moments of that, but don't present the full package. Your Hunter from the Future has one of the best openings of all time. It is side-splittingly terrible, and I cannot take my eyes off it, but the rest of the film is kind of meh. But Yours World is a disposable B-movie that always knew what it was, it just has some exceptionally bad bits. The Room and Double Down are entirely sincere, and at the same time, completely misfiring. They are so bad they're good, because they don't seem to have any idea that they're bad. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I think this lack of self-awareness, and how strongly that comes across, is what makes the true So Bad They're Good movies just that. They end up being not only movies, but windows into the minds of crazy people. Look, once somebody gave me a 16-page script for this thing called Pop the Shark. Or... Pope the Shark? and it was about a shark, or a shock, that would break into the bedrooms of teenagers who were being bullied and tell them not to be a pussy owl. When I asked the writer what Pop the Shock was, he said, it's me, but in different trousers. Madness is interesting. Double Down is a great example of this. Written, directed, produced, edited, starring, and wrangled by Neil Breen, it's about a hacker whose childhood sweetheart, her childhood, not his, has been killed and he has to stop a terrorist attack. Or start a terrorist attack. It really is quite hard to follow. Get a grip, Neil. Your wife's dead. Your wife's dead, Neil. Here, Neil. Take these pills, Neil. They'll really help you sleep, Neil. You really need to sleep, Neil. It's the severe degree of misplaced self-belief that makes The Room, Double Down, and something like Birdemic, bad movies you could sit through, together with lack of self-awareness and the sort of alien perception of the world and movie norms that only come from genuine weirdos. Delusional narcissists make the best bad movies, which is why Birdemic is fascinating, because it was a serious attempt, and it's why Birdemic 2 
which was an attempt to cash in on the notoriety of the first film, isn't fascinating. You can't deliberately make a good, bad movie. You can make something that's ironic, something that is a pastiche, but I think movies that try to be deliberately bad end up being artificial and lose what makes those movies interesting. And what makes them interesting is the delusion. Director Ed Wood really did think, yeah, that's fine. Neil Breen really did think, yeah, that makes sense. Did you really, Neil? Really, I think it's very rare, and there are plenty of movies made by delusional people that aren't noteworthy. I think the best way to consume these movies is probably with friends, unless you're into real cinematic masochism. But I also think that the best way to consume these movies, unless they're really out there, is probably in clips. Of course, if you're like me, it's often most interesting to consume these movies without watching the movies at all, but instead reading about the production and watching behind-the-scenes footage where actors hint that maybe, just maybe, no one on set knew what the hell was going on. The disaster artist, the book, is a page-turner, and I think writings like it are often fascinating because they reveal how broken the decision-making process can be, and I think that's something that almost everyone can relate to. We've all had bosses that are really clueless. We've all worked in places that behind the scenes are really in chaos. I think it's often attractive to try and work out what was really going on behind certain failings. Not a so bad it's good movie, for sure, but I would hazard a guess that if you could see minutes watched, there'd be a comparable amount of time spent by people world over watching videos and commentary demonstrating and mocking The Phantom Menace as watching the movie itself. Certainly, the behind-the-scenes footage is far more interesting than the movie. You can't you can do it. You can't destroy these things. You know. It is possible. It's interesting to analyse odd choices. Benjamin Bratt as the hunky love interest in Catwoman. Why did that happen? Why did any of that happen at all? And the really, weirdly bad movies that are made with a crew of five instead of a crew of a hundred, they almost distill what makes big budget muck-ups so intriguing. They are kind of different. With something like Catwoman you can think, how did all of this get through so many levels of professional scrutiny? But, on both ends of the production scale, I think it all really comes down to why did this happen? What were they thinking? So I think these are really two facets of the same thing. Of why some, really very few, movies are so bad they're good. It's wondering, as you watch or read about the movie, what on earth the production thought they were doing. But it's also the content itself, breaching odd, misjudged, and so technically bad reasonable oversight is impossible, boundaries. I mean, how did anyone think this dubbing was acceptable? There's a story there. Hi! Hi! I'll be right back with you. Well, there you go. I'd love to know what you guys think. Don't forget to leave a like, and join me next time where I'll be talking about how the Predator films changed over time. See you then. Great, Ferrari! Who's your friend? Holy shit, it's him! The nearest phone is at the crossroads. That's ten miles. Ten miles? Might as well be ten thousand miles. Easy, honey. It won't help to get mad.